Oh, and yeah, and we're recording this part of the call as well. Um, <laughs> it sounds like we're trying to put people off asking questions, but we're not. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, and Alice, thank you for putting the uh, those links into the uh, guidance. And what I might do is just to just to kind of get things moving. I might ask a couple of questions that I know have come up in previous calls, uh, and then everyone else just feel free to chip in after so alice i know uh one of the questions that's come up quite a bit is around vaccination and around i guess the legality of uh it, you know requesting or even insisting on vaccination whether that's for you know staff members and also what are the considerations uh for client you know people who are using the service what, what's you know what's legal you know where, where are the boundaries there so it'd be great if you could just talk to that Sure. Um, yep, very big questions that lots of organisations are grappling with and really very different legal considerations for both, um, you know, co cohorts of people. Um, so when we're looking at um, vaccination requirements for staff, for employees, um, I guess the first port of call is to look at whether there's a public health order in place that applies to the organisation and the, the work that those employees do, because if there is a public health order in place, then um, that's pretty clear. Uh, the organisation needs to comply with it. Um, if there's no public health order in place, then really it comes back down to workplace laws and the principle that uh, employers can give lawful and reasonable directions to employees um, about how to conduct themselves and how to do their work in a, in a safe way. So employers can give employees reasonable directions around health and safety matters as well in order to put in place controls that are reasonably practical to protect everyone's safety. So um, I guess the key question is, is it lawful and reasonable us reasonable for an organisation to direct employees to get vaccinated? That's that's the million dollar question for lots of organisations. Um, the Fair Work Ombudsman has published some really helpful information on its website, and I can share a link to that. Basically, the Ombudsman set out four um, different categories or tiers of, of workers that have different uh, levels of risk attached. Um, really, tier one is about people working um, on the front line in sort of um, hotel quarantine or in border control who were really exposed to COVID risks. Tier two is all about um, workers that are providing face-to-face -face services to people who are um, vulnerable to the virus or have other vulnerabilities. Um, tier three is about people that um, work with those other people in tier two and that also just work with the general public face-to-face. -face. And tier four, we're looking at people who um, don't really have to work face to face with anyone. So pretty much, um, you know, in all, tiers one and two, it's likely to be, um, well, it's almost certain that it will be reasonable to direct workers to be vaccinated. Tier three, it's more likely. So if, you, if you're doing any face to face work with other people in the public, it's more likely that a direction to staff to be vaccinated is gonna be reasonable. And tier four, that's where we start to get a bit iffy. So that, that's the sort of the general law, um, the workplace law around giving directions to be vaccinated. Um, of course, you also need to think about anti-discrimination. So is a blanket requirement on all staff to get vaccinated going to discriminate against certain people who can't get vaccinated um, because they have an attribute that's protected under anti-discrimination law? So um, the most common one really is disability. If, if a person has a medical condition or a disability, that means they can't be vaccinated. So any organisational policy needs to think in advance about how about what exceptions the organisation is going to allow. Um, uh, there's also privacy considerations when it comes to um, implementing a, a COVID-19 mandatory vaccination policy um, around when you can request vaccination information from employees. And you can find out more information about that um, in uh, our FAQs on our website. Um, if you'll indulge me for a little bit longer, when it comes to um, your clients, there's, there's different considerations, um, mainly around privacy law and work health and safety law. So the question, let's say the question is, can we ask our clients if they're vaccinated? Um, well, it, it depends. <laughs> is, it a, is it a reasonably practicable control measure to, to ask your um, clients if they're vaccinated? Is, do you have a genuine health and safety reason why you're asking or are you just you know, curious? Um, 
And then if it, if, it, if it is a reasonably practical control measure, and if it is reasonably necessary to ask for that information in order to work out how to safely provide a service to a client, then under privacy law, you're entitled to ask. So, um, yeah, if the purpose of getting that information is to work out how to deliver the service safely, then you can ask under privacy law. Uh, you do um, also need the person's consent. So those are really the two issues that you need to be thinking about when you're asking clients if they're vaccinated. Um, and of course, if clients don't want to give you that information, then you need to think about, well, how do you how do you plan to provide services safely to people when you don't know what their vaccination status is, or if a client tells you that they are unvaccinated. So that's a little bit of, um, I guess, introductory information to, to get you thinking about those issues. If there are other questions that come up as a result of that or as, as a result of further discussions um, during the session, please feel free to pop them in the chat or unmute yourself. I'm happy to, happy to talk to them. Yeah, lovely. Any other, any other questions out there? I've, um, uh, I've, uh, there's one though, I, I know this is, again, this, this has come up on a couple of the calls previously, so I'm sure it'll be interesting to people here is, uh, what are the potential, I guess, impacts on an organisation? So if, or what are the consequences if, say, a couple of scenarios, one is, um, is you know, encouraging or, or mandating vaccination and then there being a, a side effect, uh, for from that person from that vaccination, um, and even that potentially if it was a serious side effect, you know what would be the uh, legal implications for the provider. And then on the flip side of it, as I was sort of touching on previously, if um, people were to catch COVID through contact with the service, whether that's a, a client or a worker, again, are there any kind of legal implications uh, for, for the provider? Mm, um well, yep, there are there are implications both ways. Let's start with uh, if an employee uh, has an adverse reaction to the COVID nineteen vaccine. Um, I guess there's a, a a scale of different reactions that people could have. On the you know lower end of the scale, um, if people have a mild, and most people will have a, a mild reaction. Um, employees can access sick leave for that. If we're talking about a really severe reaction, um, then I suppose we're going into, um, a, you know, workplace injury territory. So it's possible that if someone were to have a really serious reaction to the vaccine that caused them an injury, they might be able to um, lodge a workers' compensation claim. Um, but, you know, as with any kind of claim like that, there are boxes that the person would need to tick in order to be successful in making that claim. The other thing to um, to be aware of is that the federal government has um, developed a claim scheme. So anyone in the community that has an adver a serious adverse reaction to getting the vaccine um, that lands them in hospital um, may be eligible to make a claim to that federal scheme. So the hope there is that if, if someone does you know, and unfortunately end up in hospital with an injury as a result of getting the vaccine, then, um, you know, the idea is that it's going to be easier for them to, to make a claim through this federal scheme rather than, um, you know, go directly to the employer. Um, so that's sort of um, some liability issues around um, vaccination. Certainly the bigger liability issue is, as you said, Jay, the, the risk that um, staff, um, volunteers, contractors and clients could contract COVID-19 um, as a result of interacting or working with the organisation. That's really the bigger risk rather, you know, over and above the risk of having a, a worker having a serious reaction to the vaccine. So really when we're talking about, you know, the risk of um, someone contracting COVID, that invokes um, obligations under work health and safety laws. So um, if an organisation isn't meeting their responsibilities under the work health and safety laws and someone contracts COVID, um, an organisation could, you know, in the worst case scenario, look at being prosecuted under, under those laws. Um, and obviously the, the other area of law to think about is negligence law. So organisations have a duty of care to the people that they work with and interact with um, to prevent reasonably foreseeable harm. Um, so um, in this situation to present you know, the reasonably foreseeable risk that a person could contract COVID in the organization's workplace. So I guess like 
I know issues of liability can be, um, you know, sometimes feel a little bit intimidating. I think the better way to look at it is that if um, organisations are taking steps um, to diligently prepare their COVID-19 safety plan and management plan, if they're taking steps to comply with work health and safety obligations, then all of that is really um, steps that an organisation is taking to meet their duty of care and to protect themselves against liability under these laws. Lovely. Yeah, thank you for that, Alice. That's really, really helpful. And um, thank you again for such considered uh, answers there. And I guess just from a health perspective, uh, we did a bit of research into the sort of uh, the safety of vaccines. I think it is important to notice that those side effects are, are incredibly rare. They do. They certainly do uh, crop up occasionally. And certainly, you know, if you if you when you're vaccinating, you know, very large populations, you are very rarely going to get some of those uh, serious uh, adverse events. But we did some, you know, just to put it in perspective, we worked out that even if the entire population had been vaccinated with AstraZeneca, which I know people had been a bit concerned about, um, then more people uh, nationally, annually would have died from lightning strikes than would have died from the AstraZeneca vaccine. So just to put it in a bit of context and perspective, because, yeah, there are significant, yeah, there are tens of people that do actually die from lightning strikes in Australia every year. So just, again, just, just to get a bit of a sense of perspective in, in the whole thing and just to uh, reinforce what Alice was saying there about the, the, the bigger risk, uh, particularly now borders are reopening, uh, is, is clearly actually COVID itself, which is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a vicious disease. It's really, it's a really nasty disease. Uh, okay, thank you for that. So any other questions? I think we might jump into uh, a um, sort of a movement. Uh, no. Yeah quick question yeah, please do kim go for it well it might not be quick and i hope i can articulate it well um but where we provide um case management to children out of home care we provide case management to their carers and we have our staff paid employees and then we also have um like close interactions obviously with a lot of birth family and extended family and obviously vaccination yeah is a big thing at the moment and trying to get our heads around as a control measure obviously that's something that we're looking at for staff I think we're doing okay with our approach but what I'm not 100% clear on is the difference between because clients our clients are under 18 so they're children and we're responsible for them because the department has given us responsibility for them to you know, um, obtain their health records, I suppose, and keep them on our systems and track it. So I believe that we're okay to hold that information on their files as we would any other health information. Carers are volunteers, technically, but they're responsible for caring for the vulnerable children. And I, yeah, so I'm just not, I, I'm not clear on where they sit because they're a volunteer. So would they sit the same as employees? Is that in terms of... Um whether you can collect vaccination information from them? Yeah, a bit of both, like what would be the expectation of carers caring for vulnerable children um, who are in out-of-home care um, and the expectation of them to, one, have the vaccine and then, two, how do we safely, like, you know, store that information so we know as a company what risk we've got in regards to carers having vaccines vaccinations and the risk that then has on the children and the birth families and the flow on to staff as well um yeah and, yeah and how to store it like what yeah so i know you mentioned consent so that's something that i've made note of yeah yeah so i think um i can give you some general information about when mm. organizations can request vaccination information uh, and then if you want it might this might be a situation where you actually want to come to justice connect for some specific advice about your obligations to, to carers and the other people that you work with. But generally speaking, under privacy law, um, you can collect health. So health information is a, is a um, type of personal information and it attracts higher protections under privacy law. So um, an organisation can collect health, health information where it's reasonably necessary for the organisation's functions and activities. So if basically, if there's a good reason for you to ask for that information, if you need that information in order to, for example, determine how to safely work with that person um, and comply with your work health and safety obligations, then under privacy law, um, you know, you, you, you have the right to ask for that information. Um, of course, 
um, you have the right to ask. It doesn't mean that you'll get it because the person has to provide their consent. Um, really, um, under privacy laws, the other things to consider are that the golden rule is really you should be con collecting the minimum amount of information that you need in order to perform that activity or function that you, you need the information for. So, um, you know, lots of organisations have been thinking, particularly around the question of, well, do we actually need to you know, take a photocopy of someone's vaccination certificate or their immunisation history, or can we actually just, you know, look at it, make a note that the person's vaccinated and let them take that record away. So that's a, a question lots of organisations are considering. On the storage front, um, yeah, it, vaccination status is health information, so it has to be stored, um, you know, in, in accordance with the law, privacy laws that apply to health information. I think the important thing to consider is um, really, you know, in what format you store the information, um, who has access to the information, um, you know, is it shared on a need to know basis, who can modify the information. It's really about protecting the integrity of it and making sure that, you know, because this is someone's private health information, making sure that it's not just available for everyone to see, it's really, you, you've given thought as to who has access to it. So I hope that helps with some of the privacy um, questions. But as I said, if you've got more specific questions about your obligations to carers or, or different people that you're working with, feel free to get in touch with Justice Connect. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's good. Thank you. I could probably jump in here to Jay um, to add a little bit to what Alice has said. We've um, in DCJ, we had getting to your point, um, Kim, around carers and, and their volunteers, uh, you know, how does that interact? We, we had a question around um, uh, an organisation asking if we mandate, if we um, go, to go through a risk assessment and decide that we're going to mandate vaccination for our staff, does that include carers? So are they considered um, a worker? Um, for that purpose. So we referred that to our DCJ, DCJ legal people and the advice that came back from them was that no, um, that foster or um, uh, relative kin carers are not considered um, a worker um, in that sense. Um, they're more akin to family. Um, so you, you can't um, mandate vaccination. Um, but certainly you'd be needing to consider, you know, the interactions that you have um, with the carers um, in your general risk assessment um, process and, and the kind of controls that you put in place. Um, and I mean, if there might be instances where a, a particular carer in, in another, you know, as an individual with another role might come under a public health order that requires them to be vaccinated or if you've got instances with sometimes carers who actually are members of staff of organisations, they might fall under a vaccination requirement that way. But in their role as a carer, the advice that we received was that, no, they wouldn't come under any mandatory requirement. And it's Kathy Turner. I was wondering if I could just pipe in here for a moment. Um, we actually have a situation with a carer who was elected not to have the vaccination. Uh, her husband has also um, actually left his job that they feel so strongly about the subject. They provide uh, care to two of our children and have done for approximately uh, five years. And uh, the children aren't over the age of 12, so don't actually have to have the vaccination. But one child has significant disabilities and uh, we've been uh, searching high and low for the answers to this question. And from what we can determine also is that the information states uh, foster carers are not required or mandated to have the vaccination. However, as she's providing a service to a child with a disability, she may be required. So um, that's where we're up to in the process and trying to find out that answer. So yeah, Alice, uh, oh, Alice from, from then Michelle, yeah. Yeah, um, yep, yeah, sounds like a tricky situation to navigate. I think this would be one where if you want some um, specific advice, for example, about how to interpret the um, public health order, um, I'd suggest that you um, get in touch with Justice Connect for some advice. I think it's a bit too specific for me to comment on right now. Yeah, of course. All right. Thank you very much. It was just an example of what's happening out there. So thank you.
Yeah, no, no, and Jack, thanks for, for asking these questions because I think it, these are exactly the sort of uh, cases where, you know, I think you all do need to, to get that kind of specific legal advice uh, because it's, it's, it's really, you know, it's a sensitive stuff. Um, thank you. That's been really good. I wanted to just, uh, just move the conversation a little bit to uh, a bit of a broader discussion, a bit of an opportunity for sort of sharing uh, across the, the group as well. So uh, when we think about the controls uh, and the sort of risk uh, risks for workers and clients, so we, we obviously talked about a lot of this stuff already, but clearly vaccination status is, 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 a, is a key risk factor consideration um, and, and as is the nature of the type of work that's being performed. But also we recognise that many of you will be working with uh, potentially uh, quite vulnerable people. So that could be uh, young people. It could be people who are potentially immunocompromised. Uh, it could be uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities who um you know, and that could potentially be the families of, of you know, children or young people that you might be working with, uh, and so particularly elders um, who, who, who may have, uh, you know, uh, more health issues, but also people with chronic conditions uh, as well. So there's a range of, of populations that we need to be thinking through uh, and thinking through to what extent they're interacting with the service. And as I mentioned previously, just what's happening more broadly, what's the overall environment? You know, when we were almost down to, when we did down to almost zero cases for there was a good stretch for a period after the first outbreak, clearly the overall likelihood is pretty low. But then the minute now we've got borders opening up, um, you know, the, the likelihood could change quite quickly of, of, of that risk uh, appearing. And then thinking through things like the extent to which you've got people traveling between sites or how they're actually getting to and from the sites and how many touch points they're having with other people on the way. And, and also, as we saw, particularly in the aged care space, uh, you know, real problems if uh, where one person potentially was moving around multiple aged care facilities and uh, infected multiple people. So again, just thinking through some of those risk factors. And in terms of the controls, I think we talked about most of these. The only things um, we haven't perhaps talked about is, yeah, it's, it's actually just the uh, the uh, good communication around vaccines. So I had a really good conversation earlier today with um, the Aboriginal Community Housing Industry Association, and a number, of, a number of their representatives were saying that in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, um, you know, social media is really popular, and there's a lot of misinformation being spread on, on sites like Facebook and some of it which is stemmed from kind of misinformation and conspiracy theories that have in some instances come from the states if it as in the united states and so actually a lot of the communication that they've been doing has just been really slow you know lots and lots of discussions over a period of time to really just try and actually uh, bring people on side not you know, have not be in showing not showing judgment to people because essentially people have views based on the things that they're you know, there's people they're spoken to in the news sources they're reading. So it's just not having too much judgment and really just trying to uh, work with people over a period of time to kind of um, talk about what the evidence shows. Uh, and then some of the worker specific issues around, you know, staggered rostering, you know, well being, protecting vulnerable workers, and then, you know, some of the client specific issues. But rather than me listing out any more of these, I'm actually quite keen to hear from you and hear from some of the uh, you know, risks that you faced. Uh, so if you move on to the next slide, Mika, I think, yeah, I'd just love to hear, um, oh, sorry, yeah, and this, this was just a note that, you know, noting the nature of the services you deliver around permanency support and family preservation services, I guess we are, we're, you know, mindful of, of the range of some of the considerations that you'll, you'll be thinking through. And I think, you know, the conversation we just have, having needs to, um, you know, really reflects reflects that. Uh, but yeah, so moving on to the next uh, slide. So Kelly, thanks for joining us. Um, no dramas. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'd love to hear if people could share some of the top risks, um, how how you've been, uh, you know, been able to address those, any sort of learnings that you've had uh, to date, really. So yeah, just love to hear from uh, anyone on the call, really. Okay, so I'm going to start picking on people. So, Kim, um, <laughs> what are some of your, your uh, lessons learned through, through COVID? 
Um, I've already spoken and you've still picked on me. Um, so <laughs> um, I think for us, um, because we have a lot I'm thinking off the top of my head here, but we have a lot of crossover um, and face-to-face contact, obviously, between youth workers, social workers, children and young people, their siblings across placements, different carers, birth family, and then out in the community as well to actually do the visits at times. So, yeah, trying to manage that um, as well as, you know, obviously at one point we had to go move away from face-to-face visits, but then you've got to weigh that up, the risk it is for the children and young people not being able to see their family face-to-face, and that's not ideal either. So, yeah, that's a big thing for us is that, and then our social workers need to be checking in and making sure that our children and young people are safe in the carers' homes. So that's something, yeah, we've put in place some, um, some like, risk forms, I suppose, and they've changed as the world of COVID has changed. Um and they continue, will continue to evolve, I suppose, around what questions are asked and how they're asked and tests and, yeah, all different things to try and manage and reduce the risk. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I think some of the points you're making, there is a, there is a, a balancing factor, isn't there, between sort of physical health, mental health issues here. So, you know, from that isolation, you know, it's, it's a very, very real issue that we need to think through. Um, Jody, I saw you coming up off uh, your, your, uh, your turning your video on so uh, did you have something you want to share I mean I think Kim's kind of highlighted the, um, the elements that we're kind of just grappling with at the moment I think um, we're starting to slowly um, move back into an office environment so for me the office is starting to get busy again um, and all that kind of thing so business continuity and what we do if suddenly um, one of us um, you know is um, test positive to COVID um, is kind of front of mind last week when I was, um, you know, back in the office. So, um, yeah, just planning around, we do have a roster system. We've got really good technology supporting us to do client um, and staff, um, you know, working and collaborating together. Um, and that's been working really well. But um, as we want to get back out doing more face-to-face, um, the, yeah, the business continuity piece is um, front of mind for me. Lovely, thank you for that, Jodie. Uh, yes, yeah, so welcome. Uh, any others? Uh, thoughts from any other? Thanks, Cathy. I can see you just. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, and look, we've got screening, and um, our action plan has um, proven crucial um, on two occasions. Um, first, of course, was initial COVID 19 in the workplace, and um, can uh, the business continuity plan. Um, actually worked quite well. Then we had a a second occasion. Um, We really do err on the side of caution and we um, implement our action plan rather quickly. Um, We've had a couple of close contacts um, in the workplace and um, we have found that our action plan works beautifully and we're able to implement quickly and we are all set up for Um, working remotely and also still continuing with our business practices and uh, providing services. And, um, of course, it's always evolving as well. So uh, me being here today is part of that um, to make sure we're covering all bases and improve um, what's happening out there. So um, we've found that to be very, very crucial um, that we can um, yeah, have a really thorough action plan. And we've been back in the workplace uh, face-to-face for quite a period of time now. Nice. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Kathy. And I think, yeah, the point you made there about actually, you know, reviewing how well the business continuity plan actually worked when you had to put it into action is, is a brilliant point and well-made because, of course, that is the, you know, the proofs in the pudding or the proofs in the eating, I should say. And so, yeah, a great opportunity to, to reflect on that and see if there's uh, an improvement. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. Lovely. Thanks, Kathy. I think, Tina, you had a point. Uh, yeah, look, a couple of things for us. Um, one thing I really appreciated by uh, from the DCJ documents that came was a reminder to think about uh, clients and families when something happens, for example, in Western New South Wales, we had a whole far, lot of families in lockdown, effectively isolated, and what sort of support we provide for them, not just the mental health 
and uh, normal kind of services that we provide, but in some cases they couldn't get access to groceries and things like that. And trying to think about what sort of support is required on that level if families are in isolation or in lockdown. Uh, and the other thing that we're grappling with now is earlier on in the outbreak, we sort of had one set of plans for things. And then when the transmission level changed, then we moved, we sort of re reviewed those plans and reworked those plans. And then it changed again. And then depending on the, the way your processes are structured, you may or may not have the documents from the way you responded three months ago or six <laughs> months ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you're doing your planning in that way. So we've kind of reworking our documents now. So we've got uh, what we call, we've got sort of three levels of transmission in our planning now. And at COVID normal, what it looks like, but then something, a, a sort of a column next to it. So we're up to the mm -hmm. next level of transmission. What are you doing now on this date? And so that you've got the document when you're using it, but down the track, if something happens and two months later you need to revisit those documents, you've got you've got that point in time information about what your response was. So I think in the way you structure your documents, you need to think about that. Yeah, no, I think that's really, really, really insightful, Tina. I like that a lot because it, to some extent, it's almost, we're in this sort of, we've had the big peaks and troughs and now we're into a series of almost uh, ripples that are much more localized. And so you're almost sort of stepping up your, your um, you know, as, as, as COVID increases in area and then stepping down again. And so, as you say, as you're stepping up and stepping down into different levels of, I guess, um, you know, risk management territory, you, you, you'll find that you keep on coming up against situations that are hanging. This is a bit like when we were just coming down from the first major peak a year ago or something. So, yeah, I think I love what you said there, Tina. I think it really does go to show, yeah, keep keeping track of the different controls that you had in uh, at different escalation levels is, is a really smart, uh, a smart thought. So, yeah, th thank you for sharing that. Uh, did uh, I think see Lynn? You've come off mute. Did you have have anything to add? No. Okay. All right. So um, look, there's uh, one last qu one last question that we wanted to ask. That just again might just throw up a few more uh, insights. So just uh, thinking through. Yeah, and this is actually a bit of a continuation. If you if you actually move on to slide thirty two, um, uh, Amika, then. Yeah, we're sort of thinking that because we are moving into this sort of living with COVID phase. And, and I think this is actually quite a nice segue from what Tina was just saying, how we are going to be moving into different, you, you know, the level of uh, COVID transmission in communities will vary uh, uh, as we start to live with COVID. And I guess I was just trying to see if anyone else had any observations about how you think the risk controls might change for your particular organisations. And I think at this particular point in time, we've, we've kind of, We've got this sort of odd situation where we've got vaccination rates generally going up. Okay, so we haven't, you know, they're not plateauing yet, but we've also got transmission rates going up because of um, there's more opening up. So we've got these kind of two factors which are kind of uh, working in opposite directions. So I think it, it does mean that where it, how it could play out in your individual, your specific locations and your specific services, um, I, I do think we need to be kind of wary that it could be there could be quite a range of different uh, experiences going forward so in light of that um how do you think your controls might need to change uh, in, in the coming coming months any other reflections on that um can i just say a couple of things we're wrestling with yes yeah, two, two, yeah. two things we're wrestling with at the moment so in, your, in our normal COVID normal world, so I don't know how other people are dealing with this, <laughs> um, in our COVID normal world, when, when we have an office environment, but we have workers that are obviously going out to the community face-to-face -face with the families and children that we work with, and then coming back into an office environment, in the office environment, when do people wear masks and when don't they? 
uh, recognising that if, depending on what your office is like, you might have good ventilation or limited ventilation and you might social distance, but if you're in a room with four desks in it with three other staff for hours on end, whether you're 1.5 metres apart or sitting next to them, is it going to make a lot of difference? <laughs> yeah, it's a kind of academic at that point, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's that. And then the other idea, and because of a, a couple of incidents we've had in uh, situ intensive family service situations where we have uh, families come to a centre, that idea at one stage in COVID where we had team A and team B, and at what point you implement team A and team B, because if, if you don't have team A and team B during COVID normal, once one person gets infected, everybody's out. And we've found in different districts, the advice you get from New South Wales Health might be different. So we get the response that our staff are considered healthcare workers. So everybody's in isolation for 14 days, for example. Um, so, yeah, so trying to work out even at COVID normal what you do sometimes to mitigate the risk. Yeah, so, well, I, I'm interested to hear other people's reflections, but a couple of reflections from me. First of all, I think going back to the issue of, you know, what do you do if you're in an office together? Uh, and I think it, I actually agree with you that there's, you know, there's only limited uh, evidence that actually wearing masks if you're sat all sat in the same office for 10 hours together even if you're you know more than 1.5 meters uh it, that 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 control probably is going to be relatively ineffective so i think it really comes back to the hierarchy of controls again which is what else can you have in place so you know wherever possible if it's reasonably practical if you can uh you know get people to be doubly vaccinated fantastic i think you know qr codes so just i mean or at least <laughs> Yeah, that's an easy way of doing it, but whichever way you're keeping track of who's in the office on which day, so at least if there is a case, then you can jump on it quickly. So, you know, I know a number of organisations have been have actually been looking about ventilation uh, options, so I know that that is a consideration. So I, I really, I think for me, it does come back to that, looking at the hierarchy of controls, seeing seeing what you can do that, that, that might be, and things like just making... Yeah, using behavioural nudges to make sure that everyone's washing their hands regularly and stuff like that. So it's it's about some of the other uh, aspects. Um, but um, but yeah, I think the other point just it it is what I would say is the the likelihood of these things happening. Obviously, as we do move towards herd immunity, so once you get up, up, up once you get a whole population up into the 90, 90s, you know, 90, 93, 94, 95 percent then herd immunity does start kicking in. And so I think generally the likelihood of, of outbreaks does, does come down. So I think, yeah, from a risk assessment perspective, I'd, I'd really be walking, watching quite hawkishly your local community to see what the vaccination levels are and seeing if there is variation within that, uh, within some of the communities. Because if, when you, if you've, I mean, Austria is a good example. Austria, the whole country has just gone into lockdown. They've got, uh, they're in the 60%, uh, sort of 60, 70% territory of vaccination. It's just not enough. It's not enough to actually prevent an outbreak from happening. You've got to get up into the 90s before you start getting that real population herd immunity. So that would be something else that I would also be just what, uh, as a key number to be looking at in your local communities. I think that that's something that you can use as a bit of a gauge of uh, the, the level of risk. But again, appreciate any other reflections from perhaps Michelle or Alice, if you had any other thoughts on that. Not really from me, just that, you know, the, the duty under work health and safety laws, um, you know, continues to apply as circumstances change. And we know that, um, you know, everything, everything's going to change as it has changed over the last year and last two years. So yeah, just that, that risk, that obligation to continually do risk assessments and continually to manage risks um, has, I suppose, a legal basis for it as well. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Michelle, anything else to add? No, I, I was going to actually say what um, Alice was saying, just reiterate, you know, the dynamic nature of this and the need to, to continually update. And, and it, it is, you know, it is tricky because you need to, as you pointed out, Jay, you need to be aware of what's happening in 
in not just the kind of broader New South Wales and but in your local community um, really helps to have an eye on that to, uh, to understand the full risks um, and uh, your clients and your staff. Um, but it, Tina, it sounds like you're really on, on the right track um, with, with your scenario planning for your different, you know, COVID normals and, and different situations. Um, and, and that's what we encourage you to do. Um, be interested to hear what, what anyone else is doing in that space, um, particularly around that, that issue, like you're saying, of the, the COVID normal. Because it is easy in, I think, in, in, in the current circumstances, yes, to slip into sort of a little bit of complacency. Um, I, like yeah, and that complacency point it was, it was when we were speaking to some of the Aboriginal community housing providers this morning, particularly if you're potentially in rural or remote areas that actually haven't seen any COVID up to now, that you might sort of almost see, oh, you know, some of the language is almost, oh, this is a bit of a Sydney thing. And it's like, well, it's not going to be just a Sydney thing uh, now that borders are opening up. So, yeah. Um, any other uh, questions, uh, any reflections, for people on the call? I think. Uh, I saw Michelle coming off. I was wondering if you had anything to add. Just want to make sure everyone. So I, I think just in the last couple of minutes of the course, if there's any, are there any final questions that people have. Um, so if not, then I think the uh, there's a couple, a couple of things just to mention. One is um, one thing that we learned on one of the calls earlier is that on your Service New South Wales app, uh, you actually nowadays, as COVID numbers are starting to increase again, um, so you, you've got the number of cases is going up, even though actual number of hospitalizations is, is now not going up because of the high vaccination rates. But um, if you are a close contact, you might actually just, the only way you might hear is through your Service New South Wales app. So have a look on your phone and you might find actually that actually the, 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 that you will get recorded. So in some cases, pub, it's, it's becoming, that's becoming the, the primary means of them communicating whether you've been um, a close contact, you may not necessarily get a phone call uh, or an email. So that was something that we heard earlier, uh, which uh, is was news to us. We thought it was it uh, worth sharing. Um, and um, yeah, I think apart from that, I'd just like to say just a huge thank you to you all for attending this session. I hope you found it helpful. Hope you can kind of spread some of this uh, both in new organisations and more broadly. Do do pass on um, the links to this to any other organisations or colleagues that might find it useful. Uh, Alice, thank you so much for your pearls of wisdom as ever. Uh, Mika, thank you for co-presenting with me. Um, Michelle and the rest of the DCJ team, thanks also for, for joining the session. Um, so, Michelle, I'll leave you uh, to sort of say the final word uh, from your side, really. Sorry, I'm just having trouble with the mute button at the end. Um, look, I just wanted to say a very quick thank you. Thanks, Jay and the team, and thanks, Alice. Um, and thank you very much for coming along, everyone, and participating today. I hope you found it useful, um, and there's some good, good um, insights that you can take away. Um, if you are looking for more information, I'll put in the chat now. There is a resource page on the DCJ website um, that we're continually updating. Um, as tricky questions come in, we update our FAQs. Justice Connect's got their FAQs. Um, there's a lot of resources out there. Please access them if you need them. Um, but that's all from me. Thank you very much. Yeah, lovely. Thanks very much, Michelle. Thanks, everyone. And yeah, best of luck uh, putting all your plans into practice. And uh, I hope you manage to keep COVID out of your uh, services. Take care, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Cheers.